Welcome back everyone! As you can see, this is a little bit of a departure from the norm, because I'm actually doing this traditionally for once. So, as you'll be aware, it's Inktober at the moment, and I have committed to doing an Inktober this year. I have a, a rough sort of idea of a story in a sense, and uh, I'll see where it evolves. I don't actually know where it's going to go, but I want at least all of these images to be sequential. And uh, I actually chose to just start a new sketchbook so that all of my construction and then final drawings are actually going to be in one place, which should be quite nice to go through afterwards. So the general process here is that I'm using the left hand page to sketch out my ideas, get a pose and uh, probably sketch out a composition for the final illustration. And then I can go back and use all of this stuff as, as reference whilst I um, go straight in with ink on the right hand page. Uh, going straight in with ink isn't necessary for Inktober, but it's sort of one of the, like a true Inktober, I believe, is is something which you, you're only using ink for, and it helps test you on your planning ability, your pre-thought, um, mapping stuff out visually in your head onto a blank paper so that you can execute immediately and um, ideally execute correctly. So of course this is very difficult because um, without construction it's very hard to like imagine exactly how uh, things like foreshortening and uh, general proportions should match up against each other. I think that's the thing I find most difficult and even sketching in pencil here like where I can rub out although I'm choosing not to. Um, it's essentially the same issue except of course it feels like less pressure because it's a softer medium you can press um, you can press lightly and get a much thinner stroke or a much uh, less present stroke. So you have a lot of freedom to lightly put things in before you commit to ink. And of course, uh, with ink, it's basically there or it isn't there. And I sort of cheat in occasions where I'll use an incredibly fine liner and kind of scratch at the paper. So I, I leave a sort of half line there. But the point being that I will use this space to plan out and warm up slightly to make sure that I'm sort of, I'm ready to actually uh, do things correctly the first time. And then, yes, later on I will switch over to the right hand page, take out my ink pens and get to the actual illustration. So at first you can see I was just working out poses and this is quite useful because having the pose visible allows me to see the areas which I know are either going to be difficult, not exactly like I'd expect them to be, um, or just places where I need to put in a certain detail, a specific detail, uh, for some reason. So I've already kind of established this uh, design of this character, and I want to make sure it's it's reasonably accurate from piece to piece. This is actually the fourth of the Inktober uh, illustrations so far. Um, it was only at this point that I actually realized, oh, it would be quite fun to record these because they they encapsulate the entire process from start to finish, which is quite nice. Like I think some of that is lost when I'm doing things digitally because firstly you can't always be sure what tools I'm actually using at any one time. You know, what sort of Photoshop shortcuts am I using to make something happen? Um, this is like a fully transparent process, uh, which is really nice. So you can see I've done all the preparation sketches that I think I need. Um, I think I've chosen that middle sketch that I did first for the composition. And at this point, it's time to just go straight in with ink and uh, hope we don't mess it up. So the little square you saw in the top right, um, I think that's the actual composition I'm going for. And this is really useful because by knowing roughly where the elements of the scene sit on the page, um, I can make sure I don't start drawing in the wrong place because that's, that's very possible, um, especially if you sort of, if you start with, say, the head, and you sort of put the head in the middle, but you forget that as the rest of the body uh, gets closer to the camera, and the foreshortening on the head is far more apparent, um, things like the flippers, you know, become as long, if not longer, than the actual body um, as they grow, as they uh, come towards the camera. So even though intuitively I think these, diff these lengths aren't going to uh, get too close to the edge of the canvas uh, without actually plotting that stuff out beforehand. Um, there's, there's no way I can really tell. And I mean, that's one of the 
really difficult things about uh, going straight in with ink. It's that I need to try and imagine perspective and uh, and feel it in my head before I actually put it on paper. Um, I say feel it because I think with a lot of these things, um, I'm no longer constructing grids and uh, and things like that. I'm very much maybe thinking about tubes, but a lot of the time I'm directly translating my understanding of a, a more complex form, like a leg, into 3D space. And because I'm trying to do all of that at once to you know get an accurate outline like I'm doing here, uh, it's, it's just another layer of complexity where I need to make sure that something like that thigh which is coming towards us, again, I know what the length of the thigh should be, but uh, its apparent length on the page is almost non-existent because of the foreshortening. And that's the sort of pre-planning that requires a lot of concentration. Um, and also, you know, having a little pre-sketch, uh, that's going to alleviate a lot of the problem because I already know what to expect from this shape and how much uh, space I expect to fill. Anyway, this, uh, this pen is the Pilot High Tech C, 0.3mm. Uh, very, very nice. I might need to buy another set of them because I've been using them a lot since I first bought, um, I think, a set of six. And unfortunately, I've dropped two of them on their nib, which has bent it and meant that they're basically useless at this point. So, uh, unfortunately, I got through the pens a little quicker than I thought. And as you can see, this one's basically out of ink too. But this is a particularly useful one because I can kind of use it on its side and uh, get an, an even thinner line than it's supposed to make. Uh, you can see the heel at the bottom left of the image. Like, I did sketch out a line there that was a bit too far, like it exaggerated that shape of the heel a bit too much. And I've just left it there because it wasn't such a heavy line that I needed to commit to it. So I could just sort of leave it at the side. I mean, now it looks almost like a bit of motion. Uh, a slightly sort of comic-esque uh, indication of motion, but... Um, yeah, because I can sort of be a little more tentative with this line, it's typically what I use first when I'm sketching the things out. And then the other pen that I will get out later is the Tombow Furunosuke. Uh, I think it's the hard tip. And that's like a, a brush pen that, because it's got quite a, a firm tip, it means I can also get these very, very thin lines and then pull the pen to its side and press down harder to widen the line as I go. And that's so useful for getting the like the thick sort of uh, cal calligraphic, calligraphy-esque. I think calligraphic is a word. Um, feeling to these lines where they, they flow from thick to thin. Um, and trying to get that sort of thing in a single stroke is actually going to look a lot better than trying to construct it just by filling in with this little thin pen. So you can see I put it away at this point and get it out to get these nice um, flowing curves. And of course, in general, what I'm doing here is that I'm using uh, the thicker lines just to denote stuff that's actually closer to us. So in general, my thoughts on this are that if you imagine this character was actually a cardboard cutout, and they had an outline which existed in 3D space. And you kind of just, you flattened them um, relative to you so that their head was further away and their feet were closer to you. Obviously they wouldn't look exactly like this, the overlaps wouldn't work, but the thickness of the lines as they get closer to you would obviously get thicker. Uh, but beyond that, the things that are foreshortened the most would remain thick compared to the things that are um, essentially perpendicular to the camera. So what I mean by this, if you look at the flipper that's coming towards us, the line that's curving down remains thick. And then as it curves up and into the top of the foot, um, at that point, because that line is approaching horizontal, perpendicular to the camera, it's no longer going to retain the thickness because it has been foreshortened to be thinner. And so that's really, really useful. And you can see uh, I get quite subtle with it where um, on the back of the heel, it thickens and then thins for the the line that's, again, closer to the horizontal. And then the same thing in the leg. So as it goes up behind the calf, 
it's thicker at first and as it trails off to the right it becomes thin again and this is a really nice way of uh, essentially tricking tricking you into thinking that there's a plane that's been warped down so obviously I also then want it to feel like a 3d object so a lot of the time what I'm doing is then putting some sort of indication inside that shape um, that makes it feel more three-dimensional but as far as the outlines go I'm really treating it as if it's a, a flat object which is essentially necessary when you're using um, line work versus values and especially when you're you know, um, trying to construct things first like essentially you can't construct things from the inside out it has to be the outline it has to be the final um, representation of that in the image because you can't erase you can't go back and I'm not painting over anyway bottom left you see Octoplushy I figured it would fit the theme pretty well seeing as I have a couple of those sort of cute um, dumpy octopi in the previous uh, illustrations I figure I'm going to put them in all of them, at least whilst this story remains underwater. I think I'm going to have a little octopi the whole time. He's a, a little felt, uh, stuffed felt toy that I made, God, maybe like five years ago now. I'm, I'm very tempted to go back and actually um, start making cute things like that again, because there's something lovely about, firstly about doing traditional, but also just making physical tactile things that uh, yeah, I can't really replace with uh, digital work. You can see on this back leg, I'm choosing to make it a single... Uh, it's not quite a shadow because the material of these flippers uh, are also dark, but I'm, I'm blocking it in completely. And I generally will uh, draw out the outline of the any sort of highlight that I want to leave within there. So here I'm going for a shiny black material. Um, so I want there to be like a nice clean highlight running through it. And you can see I drew that out with the thin, with the fine liner. And the thing to be really careful is that when you're drawing it black on white, you perceive it with the thickness of the line. So you perceive it as thicker than it actually is. And when you go to fill it in, the thickness of the line becomes part of a shape which means it actually encroaches on the highlight size that you thought you had. And of course, in this case, I, the thinner the better, as long as it remains readable. Um, you know, I wanted to have that fine, uh, realistic feel, but it's, it's really worth thinking about when you're approaching something like eyes, for example. Um, in a piece I've done elsewhere, I drew out two little circles for the eyes, and they were the, the size I wanted them. But when it came to actually fill them around with darkness, um, they become a lot smaller. At least you perceive them as being a lot smaller. So it's worth bearing that sort of thing in mind. Um, obviously, you can't go back and change it when it's in ink. And so uh, being very careful around those areas is also important. Like uh, <laughs> if, you, if you rush it, then you're more likely to accidentally put a line or just encroach on the space that you're trying to leave blank. And so really, it, it feels very much like the sort of discipline you need to use when you're doing watercolor. Not that I really have any experience with that, but um, planning ahead where you want negative shapes to be is really, really important. And so that's why a lot of these lines that I'm doing up in the right now, um, I'm leaving them kind of broken. So I'm leaving spaces and gaps um, so that if I want to put something in front to add to the depth of the piece, um, I can quite easily. And with this piece in particular, uh, I want to put in, and I call it this underwater life, to make it feel overgrown, like old and uh, taken over by nature. So I'm leaving gaps so I can start to draw things like uh, seaweed and algae and stuff growing over the top. And the other thing that I'm um, utilizing this piece is that by having block colors only in the character, which is the closest thing to us, and then relegating the background to only thin, broken lines. I'm essentially uh, giving them depth. So uh, as an alternative to having 
value groupings that are closer together and feeling washed out. Um, I don't have any of that at the moment. Like I do have values, but it's basically on or off. And there's no color to speak of. So I have to use other techniques to try and make something feel like it's low contrast and unimportant background detail. So obviously in this case, it basically just means keeping the lines as thin as possible and like not creating uh, fully connected lines. So it feels a bit more airy. So you can see I've put in the rough structure of the uh, the cockpit of this big sunken, sunken vehicle. And um, in those windows, to, to sell the depth of them, I have the outward shape with its cutouts. And then I have that inner inner line to you know add that secretary level and give them the, the thickness that you'd expect. And you can see quite clearly on that one of the beams in the middle, sort of in between her two hands. Uh, I've highlighted the thickness of that beam so that where it overlaps that secondary line, it becomes more obvious. And um, this is something which I've started to do in quite a few places, like bringing attention to small corners like that so that it really accentuates the depth that it creates. And then in other places, I think just in small corners, um, I'll fill in a slightly thicker chunk of line. And this is sort of just mimicking the sort of thing that uh, ambient occlusion would cause. So, you know, two surfaces meet each other, light can't get in. And it gives a far more natural feel to the whole piece. Um, generally having a bit of um, movement in how thick the line is, is a great way to make it feel more natural. And you can see I'm doing the same thing to these, um, these little flat jack octopi. Octopuses, sorry. Um, I'll draw out their, their little tentacles and then in that gap I'm thickening the line and making it clearer that that's, that is like a cutout shape. Again, because we associate the little pockets of darkness with, with holes, um, with things where ambient occlusion uh, would be found. So as far as finishing this piece off, I think really at this point, the squint read is, is starting to work very well. Um, I have just enough uh, thickness in the cockpit, although I think I'll probably add to this, um, so that even at a squint read you still feel some of the shapes. Um, and of course the, the diver at this point is, is looking pretty strong um, because it has those large chunks of value. So yeah, I think that's me finished. Um, I intend to make some more of these because I think they're really interesting. Um, it's it's nice to break down something that's not digital for once. Uh, but yeah, you can find the the full story on my Instagram. And I will hopefully make another one of these soon. Bye-bye.